this, um, this talk was originally scheduled to take place at the end of the summer semester and has become, as the summer semester sort of um, dragged itself to a sort of petered out, uh, the presentation was postponed. Um, I think Mark liked the title, so I've kept the title, but some of the content has um, actually changed to describe things that I've been doing in the last, uh, in the last six months. The basis for this research comes out of work that I've been doing looking at social media in activist organisations. But I've also been particularly interested in how uh, online media has been changing uh, politics. Probably the easiest way to think about this is to, is to sort of imagine that, and welcome to a, a lot of people I don't actually, excuse me, a lot of people I don't actually recognise here, so welcome to all of you. Um, the basis of this presentation is just to think about how social media is affecting the campaign for the Scottish, um, Scottish referendum. So we know that there's going to be a referendum on, excuse me, on September the 18th next year. That we can say that this isn't the first social media election. There have been other elections which have been social media based. Um, that we can look at, say, the English Police and Crime Commission of elections last year. Not a lot of online presence involved, um, involved in that. Similar to the alternative vote referendum in England. The particular interest for the use of social media in this campaign is that the parties are sort of relatively back from the campaign itself. You have two campaign organisations set up to represent each side. And the argument I'm going to be making is that we've seen the emergence of a whole array of peripheral organisations that are involved in the use of social media to campaign who are sort of loosely tied into, uh, tied into, the, tied into the two official campaigns. Um, that the relationship between them is quite interesting because they're making use of the affordances of social media technologies in ways that didn't really exist up until four or five, uh, four or five years ago. So it's fairly obvious that most of you actually live in Scotland, most of you are actually aware that there, that there is a referendum going on. In other presentations I've done on this work, I've been focusing particularly on the sort of politics aspect of it, and in the data analysis aspect of it. So I was expecting that I'd have a nice audience of about four people here and we could have a discussion <laughs> about the, um, uh, the, so the particular social informatics issues around how people are, are learning and developing the use of social media, particularly looking at, uh, uh, at Twitter and Facebook. So I'm not going to say too much about the actual politics of the election campaign, although I might drift off into that occasionally. I'm not going to say I'll say a bit, but not too much about the actual analysis of the data that um, that we've been collecting. Um, so there's, there is an election that's going to take place uh, next year. There's a lot of analysis about, well, what, what is the what are the requirements that citizens have to make up their mind about how they are actually going to vote in the election? A very common assumption which has influenced both of the two campaigns, has come through data, uh, particularly data collected in the Scottish Social Attitude Survey, anal analysed by Curtis and Ormston, that found that when people were expressing what their attitudes were to whether they would vote for or not vote for uh, Scottish independence, that it came down to, well, what would be the economic consequences of Scottish independence? So the interpretation that was taken from this is that the campaign should spend most of their time explaining about why, from either of their perspectives, independence would be a good thing, independence would be a bad thing, how much independence would actually cost people. That this took the official campaigns away from seeing the, the campaigns as being about national identity. Um, I think now, when you talk to people involved in the campaigns, they realise that in some ways this was almost a, an artefact of the research, in that when people were asked the question in the Scottish Social Attitude Survey about do you support Scottish independence and what is it that influences your decision, that people will tend to rationalise that as being to do with the economy, that people would not 
people are very unwilling to say, I think Scottish independence is a good thing, but I think it's going to cost us an enormous, um, enormous amount of money. So people who decide that they actually support Scottish independence tend to see it as having beneficial economic impacts rather than the um, other way around that was assumed. There's also been a number of surveys, and I particularly focus on the one because they're local people, uh, Jan Eichhorn and Lindsay Patterson, uh, funded by the ESRC, that looked at young people and their attitudes to uh, independence. And there, the main insight was that there's an awful lot of don't knows that these people who were these young people who were undecided, that their claim was that they actually wanted more information, that the campaign should be about giving people information about this is what will happen when Scotland becomes independent, or what will happen if Scotland does not become independent. The difficulty for the campaigns of sort of acting on that sort of information is basically nobody knows what happens if Scotland becomes independent. It's about the system of government. We decide that. The, it will elect, Scotland will elect its own, uh, its own government, then it's a matter of what that government is about, well, what is that effect is that going to have on a whole series, uh, series of issues. So the early assumption was that basically this is a campaign about national identity. It comes down to your question about, well, do you, and what is called the Merino question, about um, when you ask people how do they identify, do they identify as being Scottish, do they identify as being Scottish, predominantly Scottish but a bit British, do they identify as being equally Scottish and British, do they identify as British and a bit Scottish, or do they identify as being wholly British? So the two campaigns are basically now increasingly about the two identities and the two, uh, and the two competing identities, and most of the analysis of data about how people are planning to vote is that if you believe that you are Scottish, wholly Scottish, that you will support uh, independence, you will tend to support independence. If you even think that you are a little bit British, that you start to become increasingly sceptical about, um, about independence. So there's this debate going on about um, national identity. A particular issue that I'm interested in is how the online campaigning is not actually about the first two of these. It's not about making people aware of what the cost of independence is going to be. It's not about telling them about what the world is going to be like if Scotland becomes independent. It's basically an enactment, a performance of, um, of national identity, whether that is a British identity or uh, a Scottish identity. Um, so we like, because we're a business school, we like the idea of um, crowdsourcing. Um, so some of you might have found this, this is all sounding very exciting, this idea of Scotland becoming independent. Um, to slightly dampen down your excitement, it's it fair to say that it is now very, very unlikely that Scotland is actually going to vote for independence next year. If any of you have some brilliant crystal ball that suggests to you that Scotland is going to vote for independence, I wouldn't be sitting here, I would be sort of straight down the, down the bookies. So one of the things that we've been doing is scraping uh, betting websites uh, to keep tracking the best odds for a yes victory and a no victory, and then recalculating those back into the implied probabilities. So at the moment, the odds, the odds are stacking up that they imply that there's eight roughly an 80% probability that it will be a no vote and a 20% probability that there will be a yes vote. That's a sort of very, it's a sort of very interesting mix because it's a 20% probability is not insignificant. So for lots of organisations, it means that they do have to think about... But that's not the same as saying the vote will be 80-20. No, that's no, no, no. That's the same way, so who's going to win? Yeah. That's, yeah, it's, it, 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 I very strongly bet it will not be 80-20 <laughs> um, either way. It's... it's uh, what, is the, what is the probability that one side will win or the other side will win? And at the moment, the odds suggest that people who are willing to put their money on the line think it is. And if, you, and if your probability was, your personal insight is out of line with that, you should be betting, basically. So it's not looking great when people are going down the bookmakers. It's also not looking great for the Yes campaign when you look at opinion polls. The opinion polls are a, are a bit closer, but have been relatively static, showing a, a roughly four, 60, slightly under 60% uh, no vote, 40% uh, or slightly over 40% yes vote. Uh, an awful lot of noise in the opinion polls, lots of interesting questions that people have looked at about the methodologies of the... Um, 
the measurement, how the questions are asked, uh, and so on. There's been one poll, panel-based poll recently that actually had the um, yes side ahead. Uh, but mostly there's a fairly consistent pattern that has the no side um, well in front. When we think about social media, uh, we don't want to drop in, sort of uh, take the assumption that people who are involved in social media are all sort of young people and it's not old people, um, old people like me who are involved in Twitter and Facebook. Um, but a very large proportion of young people are at least engaged, particularly in Facebook, but also to some extent in Twitter. It's interesting that uh, Icon and Patterson's survey of young people found that amongst young people, uh, the yes side was still more or less equally um, equally behind. So they got a 20.9% yes vote, 60% uh, 60 um, 60 no vote. So this is all making the, the Scottish referendum seem not very exciting. Unless you've got a bet on it. Sorry. Unless you've got a bet on it. Yeah, if you've got a bet on it, it livens up absolutely no end. Um, or, you're, or you're a politician when you're likely to see your career go totally up in smoke in a year's time. Sorry. So there were the two official campaigns, uh, Yes Scotland and Better Together. So these are basically coalitions of the, of the two sides, so that each of the two sides has a number of parties involved. Uh, the Yes Party is <coughs> dominated by uh, the SNP, but also involves the Green Party and fringe cam uh, uh, peripheral, cam peripheral parties of the left. Better Together is sort of the uh, traditional unionist parties, uh, Liberal Democrats, Conservatives, and the Labour Party, and they all have social media presences to to basically push their push their case. So this is a track starting. Um, at the end of or middle of February, looking at how many people have liked the two campaigns on Facebook and how many people have followed the two campaigns on Twitter. Can anybody tell me what is sort of interesting about the first of those um, first of those graphs? If anything, they're quite close. They're quite close, and they started off. They, they started out. Um, uh, very close. The, the bit on from May the first. What happened then? That was the announcement of the well. The first bump, the bump over there was the actual announcement of the um, date of the referendum. Yeah. Um, are they real people? Are they real? That is a very good question. Probably they are not real people. This <laughs> is the, the, when you look at. Yeah, you would funny. expect the pattern, and if you, of. Facebook likes to be a fairly sort of organic process, and the Twitter, for instance, I'll come on to, looks pretty nice, sort of smooth line. The Facebook likes of the two campaigns behave very strangely in that suddenly, particularly the Better Together campaign, has gone through periods of suddenly starting to put on enormous numbers of members as they try to catch up. So the implication of that is that, and that I'll especially if I'm being videoed, um, I wouldn't want to suggest that the Better Together <laughs> campaign I'm actually buying uh, Facebook um, likes, but some, I'm pretty sure somebody is buying Facebook likes uh, for that campaign. They remind, wanted... me, remind me what Grant Schatz did before he became a top... <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a marketing guru. Uh, you don't need to be grand shams to work this out. Uh, you just, uh, and the sort of interesting point is that absolutely anybody could be buying Facebook likes for um, uh, for these campaigns. And then the interesting thing is that as soon as the these steps start to go up, the other campaign starts to go up to basically run away from uh, to run away from them. So I started out in February thinking, oh yeah, this is it's pretty easy to analyse um, social media around the campaign. We'll just look at what people are saying on these Facebook, the official Facebook pages, how they're growing, what the relative um, growth of the two sides is. Um, but I would take these numbers with an almighty great um, pinch of salt on Facebook. Because effectively, people can like Facebook anonymously, so you can have accounts that are just being paid to, to like Facebook. Twitter is, and, and this is a very significant point I've developed later, Twitter is a lot more complex because if you follow somebody on Twitter, you are identifiable. That, that other people can find that account and can find out, well, who are these people who are following 
the two campaigns. So you see that the lines are further apart on, on Twitter and have actually been um, diverging. That um, if you went back to February, uh, the Yes campaign was about one and a half times ahead. It's now creeping towards being two times ahead on, um, on the number of Twitter followers. So there has been this growing engagement with the two uh, official campaigns. But it's not just the two campaigns that are actually involved. But what we're seeing is a, um, a whole spread of different actors who, and institutions who are engaging in social campaigning around the, uh, around the referendum. So in the top right hand corner you have the two governments, they're not, they're not that active, that they very much claim that what they are doing is trying to disseminate information. The two political campaign or the political parties who are behind the two campaigns, they all have their own social media presences, their own Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook pages, their own Twitter accounts, etc. At the centre of it we have the two official campaigns of Yes Scotland and Better Together. And the bit that I've been particularly interested in is really the bottom half of this is the emergence of sort of what I've described here as quasi-autonomous and autonomous campaigns where people basically say, well I could just join, I could just follow Yes Scotland or Better Together but for me the Scottish referendum has particular salience or there's some particular aspect of the Scottish referendum that I'm particularly interested in, I will basically set up my own personal campaign to, um, uh, to try to bring about a yes or a no vote. There's also a lot of activity in the media and the use of social, <coughs> uh, social media by the media has become more and more influential. It's very interesting how journalists have started to use um, particularly particularly Twitter, and then there's a level where you have just individuals have their own personal blog, their own personal Facebook pages, and they're making statements of support, uh, of support one way, one way or the other. Um, to try and get people to come along to um, uh, my talk earlier in the year, I was going to spend a bit of time uh, <coughs> sort of being a bit critical about an ESRC research project that's at Strathclyde uh, University, where They've got a nice pile of money to look at um, uh, people's engagement in, um, in social media around the referendum, and good luck to them on that. The bit that is quite critical, or I would be critical about, is that the focus of that research in the way that it was actually first specified was to say that they were going to base this on looking at BBC uh, BBC websites that the BBC had agreed to share lots of information with them about um, who were posting comments on BBC news articles. So I guess lots of you are sort of quite widespread users of the BBC website that you'll read the story and if you lead very very quiet lives or you like to hear people <coughs> like to hear what strange opinions people have in the world, this bit where you can sort of go below the line and you find the comments and you have the same on the Guardian website and most of the newspaper websites. And when you look at the, the comments that go on to these websites, it, it gives you the impression that, that basically it's lots of people who are just really being very, very rude to each other. So this is the announcement on the 21st of March of the actual date of the, um, of the referendum within the 12 hours that the page was actually open to public comments, it got 15, 1,572 comments. Um, an awful lot of which are just basically people being very rude about Scotland and Scottish people. Um, so I've just brought out, to show you how the sort of um, discourse develops, the, the most negative comments and then the most positively rated comments. Because when the comments are made, people are then able to rate what they think about them. So the most negative comment is Scotland greedy politicians, how much Scottish people's enjoying free prescription, no tattooition fee, free education, it shouldn't be. So, but that gets voted down. And, and you'll see that most people go, there's lots of people obviously go onto these um, comment sites and read the comments and they basically vote down the negative opinions. So the second most voted down the comment was thank God goodbye moaning Scots. The most common sort of positive comment, which is sort of far more 
Uh, I have to say I'm slightly embarrassed as an English person that some of the petty and vaguely xenophobic comments from from English people. So there is, there is a gap between the people who are actually commenting, who, who can be, uh, and the comments that then get taken off by the moderators are even um, uh, less polite and the sort of the public opinion of the people who are reading it and about how they're actually rating the comments, uh, comments that they find. But the argument that I would make against basing an analysis around the BBC websites is that uh, this is only such a tiny small part of the online discussion around the referendum and about most uh, topics in topics in politics today, and it's not necessarily representative, because it's not really that anybody's actually trying to change anybody's mind here. Um, so I mentioned that each of the two campaigns have Facebook pages, and we looked at how they're both going up very, have been going up very nicely, recruiting more and more people to um, to follow their um, uh, to like, sorry, like their Facebook pages. If we just step back to, um, I think it's two thousand and nine. Facebook introduced the concept of community pages. When you speak to people from Facebook, the rationale for introducing community pages was that you would have people who decide that they're, say, students at Edinburgh University and they want to create a Facebook page about Edinburgh University, but obviously they are not Edinburgh University. And Edinburgh University might get a bit upset about a student Facebook page passing itself off as being the university's Facebook page. Facebook did not want to close down all of these people who were developing their pages about uh, Miley Cyrus or um, Coca-Cola or anything and, anything and everything. So they created community pages. And there's something interesting about community pages. You can set up a community for any group of people, in the internet, you can set up a community page about anything, but Facebook reserved the right that if the person that you have tied this community page to uh, objects to it, it can basically all just get swept up because they just say, well, this is just so much about Coca-Cola, all of this should just be part of the Coca-Cola website and you can now go away and um, find something else to build your um, build your Facebook page now. In practice, they only do that in um, extreme circumstances. So when they, when they set up community pages, they weren't really thinking that much about political campaigning. But people very quickly have realised that if you have an interest in any issue, instead of just being a passive follower of the main campaigns, which is very much the traditional model of, um, of, of politics in the UK, that you can now set up your own page and um, you can start getting people to like, uh, to like your page. And there is an enormous range of pages, Facebook pages now associated with the, uh, with the referendum. The two official, campaign are still ahead in terms of like, but these are the, the tops of the pages of the two most widely liked of the unofficial pages. So you have Yes to an Independent Scotland, Vote No to Scottish Independence and Protect the Union. These pages are sort of interesting because they feel less constrained to stay on message. They are not seen as being the official voice of the, of the two campaigns, so they can be a little bit more uh, a little bit more edgy, that um, they can start to um, they can start to go off on, on particular particular tangents. A lot of them started out being very amateur in the way that they put together. And when you look at the ones that have relatively few followers, um, that they are sorry likes, very few likes, that they are relatively unprofessional. But the ones that are really sort of building up uh, large numbers of people liking them. Uh, are now very, very professionally, uh, professionally produced, and have obviously built and have created a cause of people who are who are actually supporting them, who are moderating them 24 hours a day. Um, that they allow a certain amount of negative opinion to appear on these sites because having people who are from the opposite perspective posting comments on the um, on the sites actually sort of helps them because it sort of drives people to, makes it more interesting than the, just the sort of monotone of everybody saying how marvellous one particular side of the uh, side of the debate, uh, debate is. And 
significantly and difficult for people like um, myself who would like to actually sort of analyse them. Some of these campaigns, it is very difficult to identify who are the actual, uh, the actual actors, the individuals who are behind them. So for a lot of them, I have been able to work out and track down, um, and they want to be, almost all of them want to be, uh, want to be anonymous. The people who are actually behind the sites, but some of them just will not reply to um, uh, even the most friendly um, offers to actually get them to talk about why they actually set these sites up and what are the rules that they're using for uh, using for moderating moderating the sites. Um, so those are the two at the top. As you go further down, you get, you get to some that are not necessarily so widely liked, but are a little bit more. Um, contentious in terms of the opinions that they're actually expressing. Uh, so there is um, Alex Sandy's a deluded wanker Facebook page that has 1,459 um, likes and is a great opportunity for people who have a personal grudge against Alex Sandy to, um, uh, to, to post their comments. You also have other sort of really sort of fringy um, like uh, Jedi Knights for Scottish Independence, then you have a whole series that are, that are geographic based or for people who are in England or... And some of these are, the reason why I described them earlier as sort of quasi, quasi autonomous sites is that some of them are obviously getting a lot of support from the, uh, from the official campaigns, is that they realise that it's quite useful to have sort of a, a, a Facebook page which is the people of Edinburgh say yes or whatever, and that uh, they are not actually genuinely completely independent. And it was that sort of the, the quasi nature of their apparent autonomy that led to the sort of uh, kerfuffle and hoo ha in the middle of the summer about Labour for Independence. So, Labour for Independence is a website, but it's also a Facebook page, uh, ostensibly for. Uh, Labour voters, Labour members, Labour supporters who <coughs> disagree with the Labour policy and actually support Scottish independence. And it was found that, hardly surprisingly, that quite a few members of the SNP were quite keen on encouraging uh, Labour for independence to be seen to be a significant, um, uh, significant voice. And people say, no, it's just basically it's a bunch of fellow travellers, etc., um, etc. Et at the core of it, when you actually look at who are who are the members, most of them are genuinely people who are uh, committed to independence. But obviously, there is also an incentive to amplify the role of these sort of um, these sort of splinter groups because it, it it has it fits in with the overall strategy of um, in this case with the with the yes campaign. Um, so you have decided. That for whatever reason you think that um, the Scottish referendum is something that you are so interested in and excited in that you are going to set up your set up your Facebook page. Lots of people set up these Facebook pages and they basically, can, as in the way that some of us set up blogs, they very quickly run out of steam. Um, that their excitement with the um, Scottish referendum starts to wane after after a few weeks, and they lose all of their lose all of their followers. So there's, there's quite a few sort of zombie Facebook pages associated with the referendum. And let's assume that you are you can actually sort of hack it, and you are going to continue your engagement with the debate. In conventional websites, you would end up having to keep thinking, oh, "I have to go home and I have to write some content about um, uh, about the Scottish referendum," and that. That's going to start hacking you off fairly to think of something new, something interesting to say. But the beauty of Facebook pages is that you can basically just recycle content from other Facebook pages. So here we have from um, this is from Vote No to Scottish Independence, but you'll see the same on all of the Facebook pages. They've basically taken an article from uh, a WordPress website that they've posted it onto their site and then other people have come in and commented. So for the people who are actually managing the, managing the website, generating this content, content is relatively, uh, it's not a great job to actually be doing this. So what you start to see is a, 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 some interesting relationships developing between the Facebook pages where some of them are largely generators of content. And there's one particular site on the yes side uh, National Collective, 
these other ones on the no side that really very professionally are creating content that other people then share and place on their website, their, sorry, their Facebook pages, and then other people then pick up and share onto their personal, uh, personal Facebook pages. So there's a sort of churning of uh, content. This is also an example where you see that people are actually sort of engaging with an issue and there's a, a comment that's dealt with that comes in from somebody who's actually from the, from the opposite side. So you, you tend to see something that looks like a, a rational debate uh, following on on most of, these, um, most of these Facebook pages because it is so much in the interest of the people who are managing them to have that or else people are not going to actually... People do not, on the whole, want the look read. People just slagging each other off and um, attacking each other. Um, so we have all of these unofficial Facebook referendum community pages. Um, I could, if I was going to be pedantic, say that not all of these are technically community pages. Some of them, because people realise that the conditions of community pages are a little bit risky that you might get shut down. So people do now set these pages up as organisation pages or campaign pages. But, but most of these are referendum community pages, and you can see that there is, this is the top ten unofficial ones, um, that you have the two ones that have become quite successful at the top, then you go down forward progressively, sort of Pareto principle, into more and more obscurity, uh, more and more amateur production, uh, more and more uh, obscure niches that people are, uh, people are challenging. So that all looks quite stable. The bit that's more interesting is that when you look at talking about, talking about is a metric that is uh, calculated by Facebook for all of the pages, and it is essentially a measure of how many people are interacting with your page. So that if you were flogging some product and you set up your Facebook page, knowing that you have lots of likes, that you might well have bought, um, is sort of... It's sort of good to know, but it doesn't really give you a feel for, well, how, at the moment, how much buzz are you creating around your Facebook page? Because it could be that all of those people liked you six months ago and they've forgotten that they like you, but the, the system never forgets that you, um, unless you actively dislike or unlike something. So what you see with the actual talking about is that it is far more dynamic, that certain sites become very heavily engaged with at certain periods, some go up, some go down, that it's the, on the whole, it tends to be the unofficial sites that at any point are having the most amount of, um, uh, the most amount of engagement, and behold, what is effectively behind this, and I think I've got an example on the next, uh, the next slide, because if you, if you remember just from the then what you see here is that just in the this is from yesterday that in the last few days this Facebook page Free Scotland, which is not one of the biggest of the of the pages, has suddenly leapt up in the amount of that people are actually engaging with that page. So if you were uh, moderating that that page, you think, oh yeah, obviously we're really we're really connecting. Our message is really getting across. In practice, what drove and what is driving Free Scotland to be the most heavily engaged Facebook page this week is just this one post that um, <coughs> two individuals basically fed food to Free Scotland, Free Scotland posted up on, <coughs> on their page, and large numbers of people have uh, uh, shared so that they've embedded it in their own page. Over 1,200 people have notified that they like it, and 479 people have written comments about, about this post. And basically what this post is, is a picture of a Scottish passport that they have mocked up. Um, but lots of people say, oh, that's the sort of thing that I could just stick into my Facebook page to show, to basically perf to perform my identification uh, with Scottish independence. It then leads to quite an involved, uh, involved discussion. <coughs> so you see that this is not detailed, a lot of this engagement is not detailed discussion of policy, a lot of it is about people just finding interesting ways of expressing, um, expressing their identity. Next, by next week, 
free Scotland will, will have gone down and somebody else will have come up and they'll have come up for, for, for similar reasons. So we've been quite a lot of work following Facebook, basically scraping, although it's not technically scraping, um, through the API, uh, collecting content off Facebook, looking at the dynamics of how people have been posting, uh, the content of what they've been posting, and so on. I've also been doing the same thing for Twitter. Fundamentally, as a, as a tool of analysis, Twitter is a lot more useful than Facebook for social scientists because you have a lot more data about who are the people who are actually following individual accounts, who are the people who are actually tweeting about a particular, uh, about a particular issue. So when you look at comment about Twitter and the Scottish referendum, an awful lot of it revolves around the way that people can get a little bit abusive when they're writing um, uh, when they're writing tweets, um, and there is a sort of accepted view by both of the campaigns that this is generally a bad thing and that this should actually be um, uh, that sh this should be discouraged. It's basically impossible for the campaigns to stop people coming back from the pub and tweeting about what exactly they think of um, <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon or Alistair Darling. Uh, the difference, I mean, people have been coming home from the pub for years and years and years and thinking these things. The difference is they haven't had the opportunity to actually sort of send the message directly to Alistair Darling or Nicola Sturgeon what they think about it. So there is, a, there is a sort of assumption that this is a, this is a, this is a bad thing and, it's, and some, of it, some of it is quite unpleasant. Um, but when you actually look at people who tweet um, sort of very unpleasant things, it tends to rebound on them because they are not anonymous and it is recorded that this person has actually and the, the comments tend to get taken off, but somebody has collected them because there are a lot of people who are looking to find people being um, abusive about each other. The, for, the, for, the, for the older people in the room, we've yes. just figured out tonking means tweeting while drunk. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. Sorry for everybody tonked. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, they do not, do not tweet while you are drunk. <laughs> In the same way. with bus passes. Sorry? <laughs> Those of us without bus passes. <laughs> um, <laughs> a, I, mean, most of, I mean, there are famous people who do it. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was a great one um, yeah. from August where yeah. James McMillan, the composer, who has a history of basically um, being quite abusive to all sorts of Scottish politicians of all parties, so he's very <laughs> equal opportunity in his abuse, um, then basically for no apparent, other than the fact he was sitting at home, I guess, drinking a glass of whiskey and watching Wagner um, <laughs> from the problems, uh, then decided to send out a tweet likening the Yes campaign to Mussolini. Um, absolutely out of nowhere, and then all hell breaks loose. Um, generally not recommended, don't do it. I mean, the serious point in the sort of political discussion about how Twitter was affecting politics is, is this actually a bad thing? Is that an awful lot of the criticisms of people being quite to the point is that what they would like is that political debate to be something like a nice university, uh, university seminar where people are putting forward nice reasons and arguments about things. And for lots of people, how they think about politics is quite visceral and it's quite personal, and... So this is a return to 18th century yeah. rough music and yeah. pamphleteering. Yeah, so I thought, personally, I, states. Yeah, personally, I think it's quite, um, it's up to a point, it's quite healthy, and the point when it goes over that, it tends to damage the person who's sending more than it damages the person who's receiving. Second point about, um, which I think is very interesting about Twitter, is that it enables all of these people with their blogs and their Facebook pages to basically run their personal press agency, is that they can, they can get up in the morning and tweet their comments about uh, their blog that they've written. These tweets will then tend to get picked up by journalists. Most journalists that you meet are now big users of Twitter. It's basically the only way they know what's actually happening, uh, happening in the world. So people are becoming very skilled in how they actually use, uh, use these technology. And probably the most significant aspect of Twitter, which 
which has been identified in other areas as well, is that Twitter basically completely hemorrhages personal information. If you use Twitter, you are giving away so much about yourself, and I'll say a little bit more uh, mm. about that later. And most users of Twitter have no idea how much personal information that they're actually giving away. Um, I know that some of my colleagues like network, um, like social network diagrams, although most of the ones who are completely obsessed with social network diagrams aren't actually here. Um, I just put this in because it's, it's a nice diagram. Um, these are all the elected Scottish politicians, MSPs, MPs, MEPs, um, and it shows the Twitter links between them, who is, um, who is following who, and in relation to the independence debate, we've been looking at how Scottish politicians have actually been using, uh, using Twitter. Uh, but the networks, the networks are very interesting because what this actually, what this really shows, I would argue, is that most Scottish politicians are, are completely um, digital foreigners as far as um, Twitter use is concerned, that they're only really linked to other people in the same party, but there are a number of Scottish politicians who have developed a, a, a sort of very sensitive approach to how they actually use Twitter as part, as part of their campaign. So the ones that are most significant are the ones that are in the, in the centre, because these are the ones who have strong links into the opposite party. So on the Labour side you have uh, Ketia Dunbar, <coughs> who has a lot of following among nationalist politicians. On the Conservative side you have Jackson Carlaw, who annoys the hell out of a lot of people, but still gets followed by a lot of people on the uh, on the Labour side. And basically, what these politicians are doing is that they they've worked out very just by sort of tried and error to a large extent worked out good combinations of responding to particular tweets. So individual constituents send them messages; they will reply to those individual messages. That they put out their own tweets, but they're putting out their own tweets written in a way that they are expecting those tweets to be retweeted. Um, so there's a, a sort of high level, um, and they're retweeting other people's tweets that they think it will be useful to feed into, into their network, that they're being party political, obviously, because they can't avoid that, uh, but they're also recognising that they're tweeting to their constituents, many of whom will not actually um, necessarily be in love with the finer internal workings of the SNP or the Labour Party or the, or the Conservative Party. And then around the edge, and I think, you know, I mean, this is where I'm sort of, sort of veering off specifically about the technology into the structure of Scottish politics. Uh, around the edge of this, you have an awful lot of the Westminster MPs who are probably. The, I guess there's quite a few people who have friends who are MPs, but basically they are very sad people now because they've had all of their, um, an awful lot of their influence taken away from them. Um, so on the whole, they tend to be relatively weak users of social media because basically nobody cares what most of them think. Um, oh, well, think Min Campbell's got no friends. Oh, Min, Campbell, Min Campbell has relatively few friends. Min Campbell's not exactly, because he's got, he's got his boss pass as well. So. I mean, the ones that are absolutely shocking. I mean, the, the, it's interesting for the campaigns because the, Alistair Darling is leads the uh, the no campaign. Alistair, da he, Alistair Darling is down here <laughs> next to Eric Joyce, so <laughs> that could that could end in a fight. Um, that Alistair Darling has, I guess they, they might be friends of his here, but very nice man but hasn't got a clue about how to use social media, to be honest. Um, anyway, we'll get back to the point. So we're saying that when people follow anything on Twitter, especially when they start to follow multiple, uh, multiple Twitter accounts, they start to give a lot of information about uh, who they are, and they're starting to give information about, well, where are the followers of a, um, uh, of a particular account? So an awful lot of the work in this area, um, the people that I know, is looking at consumer products. That you are selling some product, you want to find out, well, where are the potential buyers 
of our problem. I mean, the university should be doing this to try and find out well, where are the people out there who would want to come to a university like this to study subjects uh, that we all think they should, uh, they should follow. So we've gone through and basically scoured the, the followers of the two main campaign Twitter accounts to say, well, what are, the, what are the other things that they are closely correlated with? Um, an awful lot of them are fairly obvious, that if you're on the no side, you're very likely to be a Twitter follower of David Cameron, you're quite likely to be a follower of Ruth Davidson, but then you start to move into other areas which are less sort of absolutely directly obvious. You are quite likely to be a follower of Gary Lineker. Um, you're quite likely to be a follower of Westminster newspapers. You're quite likely to be a follower of the Today programme on Radio 4. All of these are, are sort of giving a hint that you are not, that you're a little bit more English than you're Scottish in, because of that following. So just to take an example of this, this is for Lord Sugar. Uh, do any of you follow Lord Sugar on Twitter? Mm. He's got a hell of a lot. He's got three million, three million people follow Lord Sugar on, on Twitter. Why? Um, of the one of Why? his... Why? Why? Yeah, I know. How's that a scope for this talk? It's because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an enactment of a certain type of identity. It is, it is your habitus that you feel that you, sh you want to identify with something sugary. Can we have Sugarland then? Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? Can we vote for a country called Sugarland? Uh, no. No, no. no. Good. you wouldn't want to live there anyway. Um, <laughs> so get back to... So you can look at who are the people who are following Lord Sugar, you can look at the people who are following the Yes campaign, the Better Together campaign, so that in Scotland... And the other thing about Twitter accounts is that you can identify with a reasonable degree of certainty, except for people who put facetious uh, account information in, that you can actually identify which of those people are actually in Scotland. So, for Lord Sugar, he has three million Twitter followers, most of those are not in Scotland, most of them are not following either of the campaigns. So the ones who are following the campaigns, the top block represents the ones that are definitely in Scotland, 1,506 are following Yes Scotland, 1,203 are following Better Together, and 356 are following both of them. An awful lot of these people who are following both campaigns are journalists, you, you tend to find, who follow lots of, um, lots of stuff. If you remember from the split of who, who the followers of the two Twitter accounts were, that you would expect it to split roughly if, if this person had, if whatever the account was, had no relationship to um, whether people were more likely to be pro or anti independent, you would expect it to split round about 1.7 between followers of Yes Scotland and followers of Better Together. So the fact that it is 1.19, that you only, you're 1.19 times more likely to be following Better Together than Yes Scotland actually suggests that this indicates that people on the whole who follow Lord Sugar are likely to be uh, people who support the, support the Better Together campaign. So we're then building from this to do a sort of more subtle analysis to work out an index of um, propensity to vote yes or vote no. So you have some that are quite quite unexpectedly incredibly good indicators of which side people take. So you have Greg Hempel, who's a Scottish, um, despite the fact he claims to live in Northern California, which he obviously doesn't, um, <laughs> has 58,000 Twitter followers, 2.74 times more likely one of his Scottish followers to be supporting Yes Scotland than Better Together. That is more towards the Yes Scotland campaign the most, not all, but most SNP, MSPs. It is a very strong signal that people who follow Greg Hempel are going to tend to be um, uh, followers of Yes Scotland. And that, and it works the opposite way as well, that that then becomes useful information, and the campaigns are doing this as well, that becomes useful information to know because it's telling you something about the sort of people who follow you, but it's also telling you who they actually are. And you can, you can actually identify individuals who it, you can now say this is, they are probably likely 
to support, yes, so amongst the 58,000, you'll be able to say, well, there are some who haven't actually expressed a following of either side, but because they're following him, they are probably more than likely to be uh, yes supporters rather than no supporters. And then similarly, you have um, Irving Rush. And it, I mean, it's very interesting that most of the Scottish cultural figures have very strong biases towards people who are going to vote yes, which is the argument that this is in some way cultural and about, um, about identity. It's not about just the calculus of how much people are going to, um, are going to benefit. So, I'm doing for time. I don't know what time it is. Uh, it's half ten, so we have right. another I'll half an hour in the slot. I'll finish it. quickly, I'll just make some points. Um, um, so, the point of this talk, and I was going to give it in um, uh, at the beginning of the summer, was really just to have a small group of people who would actually sort of give me some suggestions about um, how the data that <coughs> in off social media sites, how that can be analysed. Lacking, um, lacking that guidance, we've sort of gone off on our, on our own way to on the one hand look at how discourse has been shaping identity, but also go down the sort of big data qualitative routes that my friend Ashley is an um, expert on, uh, to think about how particularly the Twitter data can be used to try to identify who and where and why um, people tend to split one way or the other between the two uh, between the two campaigns. So I'd argue that compared, to, like if we suddenly try to pretend that we're Martians and uh, we know nothing about Scotland, if I was to, to describe this to people who know very little about Scotland, that it's interesting because the weakness of the parties in the referendum debate has created this space that these unofficial campaigns have tended to, have tended to colonise. So that when you look at, even if you look at the American presidential election, the party and the candidate organisation still had a very dominant position. The parties do not have a very dominant position in this debate. The two campaigns don't tend to be that dominant. What that's created is this public sphere of lots of people who are having all sorts of discussions in lots of different in different directions. That Facebook and Twitter have both now really lowered the barrier to people running their own individual uh, campaigns, that it creates this potential for people to circulate content, particularly, uh, particularly in Facebook, so that people can post something on one site and it then gets shared across um, across multiple sites that they can tweet about something and it gets retweeted uh, to a much, much larger audience. That over the last um, six months, seven months, eight months that I've been, um, that I've been basically scouring all of this stuff, that you can see that the Facebook pages have become more civil, that the moderation is about trying to make sure that the debate stays quite civil because otherwise people get sort of fairly turned off to it. That the technical side of it has become more and more professional. Originally people could even sort of size the images so that they actually fitted the spaces on Facebook so there are lots of images where the text was sort of going off. Now most people have worked out exactly how to make it um, look, right, um, look right on the screen. Um, following on from other work I've done on um, activist organisations, we can argue that, that what is really going on is that individuals are using social media as part of the Giddens Centre Reflexive Project of the, of the self, that they're using it to develop their own personal identity and relating their own personal identity to the British identity or the, or the Scottish identity. That in the discussion, discussions you have a, a performance of that identity and from Wodak, who's a linguist at Lancaster University, that you can argue that, that this is a discursive construction of national identity. Certain issues, certain aspects of national identity start to uh, occur over and over again. But then the paradox in this is that if this is all about people's reflexive project to the self or the, or the discursive construction of their personal national identity, it's something quite paradoxical that for 
for most of the people who are actually involved in this, they are very, very happy to stay anonymous. They like the idea that they have some sort of um, nom de plume or what the other equivalent in um, the web world is, um, but they don't want people sort of turning up on their drive, um, criticising their particularly Facebook uh, Facebook pages. Um, the ones who are not tend to be people who fancy becoming journalists, that they see this as a route into journalism. So you do have bloggers, you do have people who have Facebook pages who are completely not anonymous, who basically turn up for the opening of an envelope if they're invited to, um, uh, panel discussions and so on. Um, but they are very much, very much a minority. Uh, the point I'm working on most at the moment is that Twitter data, and I say probably, because it's, it's interesting about how you would actually sort of prove that the analysis of this data does demonstrate that you can identify who are the supporters of either side. But it looks like it, it is a source of that. Have, have any of you ever looked at the YouGov panel website? There's this, this, you can sign up for this and you get... You get you get your name put in a raffle, and you can uh, you can be tiny or get given tiny, tiny amounts of money. And YouGov send you a questionnaire every day, usually, um, which is asking you all sorts of really weird marketing type information about how often do you read newspapers, what websites do you look at, when did you last buy a car, all that sort of stuff. But they also have a website where you go through lots of different things, which is uh, writers television programs, brands, and you have to say, do you like them, do you not like them? Please write an opinion, of politicians as well, write an opinion of them, and you can say that you really like them, then other people can look at your opinions and can say whether they agree or disagree with your opinions. The great advantage for YouGov in doing that sort of exercise in other countries like YouGov is that they do have, because they've asked you, they do know how you are going to vote. In elections. So when you go say they've done a panel, a panel poll of how people are going to vote if the general election was held tomorrow, the people who are on that panel they also know what whiskey they particularly like, what television programmes they watch, what newspapers they read. So they have a very, very detailed understanding of um, what the correlations are between certain opinions and certain sort of consumption, uh, consumption decisions. Um, the final point, which I haven't really touched on at all. Um, previously, is that in this circulation of content, it's become a very unlevel playing field for lots of journalists. If you're a journalist on a newspaper that basically has a paywall, nobody will recirculate your content. So that if you write for the Times, um, nobody's going to take a link to an article from the Times and post it into these Facebook pages that would then get shared and then effectively you'd hope sort of go viral. Um, they would rather post something that's from the BBC website, from the Guardian website, so that they can be confident that absolutely everybody who then follows that link will, will chase it up. This really upsets a lot of journalists, because basically what happens is that if you're a journalist who works on any of these websites that are paywalled, um, somebody else will see what you've written and they will basically rewrite, make the same points, but rewrite it in a... Um, Facebook friendly way that that message will then go out under somebody else's name and uh, take off. So what you now see a lot of journalists who work on these papers, they have their own blogs where they basically are plagiarising themselves almost to try to make sure that they stay connected to this, this wider community. Um, so, conclusion. I would argue social media are changing political campaigning, that the parties are becoming weakened, and the most interesting thing is this way that individual citizens are learning how to build their own, um, build their own campaigns. And that, that, that is quite a significant change in the way that the political process uh, has worked in um, liberal democracies. Okay. That's great, thanks very much.